morning. How are you guys? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So excited to be here on behalf of Q, myself, and John and John. We thank you for having us, and we thank Dr. De Leon, Dr. McCoy, Jay for setting this up, Dr. Leon, Arena Becerrado for having us here, and you are able for a treat this morning. But before we get started, how many of you got Twitter? Ooh. Raise your hand if you are on Twitter. Fantastic. If you're not, you can talk to any of those people at break or at lunch. This is us. Those are our Twitter handles. Please tweet from your sessions today. It makes us very, very happy to see those things out there. Um, and if you don't know Twitter, it's just a fantastic place to network. I wouldn't be standing up here had it not been for Twitter. I wouldn't know those two gentlemen in the back had it not been for Twitter. So if you don't know, now you know. So get to know Twitter. This morning, you are going to get something that I don't think has happened before. Am I correct, John and John? Is this new? Yes, this is incredibly new. We're is making it, it up as we're going. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we're still working on one song. Right. So, <laughs> so what's going to happen in about two minutes, it's called an as you throw down. Right? Here are the rules. John and John were given a topic that we discussed with Jay and them. Each of them, each contender, got five slides. They created their slides around this topic, and neither of them have seen the slides. The only one that has seen the slides is me, and then I let Jay in. It's a lot of power. We messed around with them last night. I'm just kidding. I did. <laughs> each contender will get 90 seconds to explain their slide. And Terry, are you my timer? Sure. Dr. Leo is going to time them. And then they get 30 seconds in which to rebut or to add on to what the other said. Are you ready? Slide are you two ready? Right now. We can switch <laughs> slides. Try. Try. You want to mix it up like that? No. no. <laughs> so, the topic today is change. The only thing constant life is, as you know, change. What are we going to do with it? So let me introduce what we've got. They're going to their corners. How about that corner? You are going to be hearing about the top Ten reasons to manage change. Because change is happening. It's not why change. It's how to manage them. Or to manage them. So, in this corner, wearing the khakis in the light blue button-up. Right. 22 years in education. He taught fourth through twelfth grade. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. He was a high school principal. <coughs> whoop, whoop. You guys? <laughs> Director, coming off of the bed, IT Director, Assistant Superintendent, Q Chief Innovation Officer, and currently the Executive Director of Q. I forgot to put on there, he's also a best selling author of the book Edu Protocols. And my favorite, helpful guy. Majority, late majority, laggards. 
Which group do you ignore when you're trying to roll something new out? Laggards. Give them 20 foot pole marks. Do you know what those are? Those are marks from a 20 foot pole that you're pushing them away with. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Fall in love with this group right here. Those are your people that'll say yes to anything, they don't even ask why. You say something like this to them. Do you want it? And they're like, yes. They haven't even answered the question, right? They're like, yes, I will try something new. Get that group running. Get that group running. And this group, just like a barometer, will start skewing toward them when this group feels left out. Okay? Now, the chasm. See the chasm right there? Right there. See the chasm? That is the jump between the 16% that on average will do anything you want and the 84% that on average will be skeptical. Okay? But the language changes. When you're on this side of the chasm, badassery. <laughs> one of a kind. Legendary. When you're on this side of the chasm, one button easy. Can't fail. This is what we're all doing. This group right here, early majority, they buy 100% of their clothing at Target. I'm <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 not judging anybody right now. <laughs> If those people are in your organization, kick them out. Get them out of your organization. Don't fire them. Don't move them on. Move them out. Send them to conferences and have them present at conferences because that will then validate that when they come home, they like, did you hear Mrs. Smith presented at the Q conference? Mm -hmm. Whoa, she's legit. It's hard to be a prophet in your own town. So get them some street cred. Get them on the road and get them some credibility so the peers are like, whoa, that guy's legit. He presented at someone else's district. I guess we'll follow him. <laughs> uh, all right, why manage change? Because celebration is a powerful change management tool. We celebrate that which we wish to perpetuate, right? So when you go to celebrate Mrs. Smith at the staff meeting for putting on an amazing school play, don't just say, hey, she put on a great school play because she's a drama teacher. That's her job. Right? You celebrate her for moving the mission forward. Our mission is we demonstrate what's possible when school and community collaborate. So we say, Mr. Smith, that play that you put on was phenomenal, but the way you collaborated with the local community to bring in the costumes from the outside and have the, the playbills up in local stores, that really demonstrates what's possible when school and community collaborate. So you're still celebrating it for a job well done, but you're telling everybody you will be celebrated in this organization when you move the mission forward. We celebrate that which we wish to perpetuate. So be wise about the way you celebrate, who you celebrate, and the manner. Not everybody likes to be celebrated the same way. Mrs. Smith wants a shout out in the meeting because she's a drama teacher and an extrovert, but Mr. Rodriguez is like, dude, if you say my name in the meeting, I would be embarrassed. I would throw a card. And if you keep a spreadsheet of all your people and how they like to be celebrated, you will make people feel appreciated, you will make people feel uh, 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 celebrated, and they will continue to move your mission forward. That's all I got. You can have my seconds back. Boom. <laughs> okay. I want to interpret what John just said. For oh. <laughs> okay. I mean, something John does that's brilliant. I'm going to get this done in 22 seconds. He sends out a Google form with about six options of how you would like to be celebrated. Some people want Starbucks. Some people want to be on the news. Some people want to be on Facebook. He lets them choose on a Google form how they would like to be celebrated. And then he's mindful of that. Okay, isn't that differentiated instruction? Yeah. Boom. Next slide. Okay, we've heard this phrase, right? Corey actually used it in the, in the beginning. I want you guys to really think about this in education. I want you to really think about this phrase. I first heard this phrase on the fourth cassette tape ever that I bought. And it's by a band named Rush. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if you look, if you listen, if you look up the lyrics to uh, New World Man, it says right there, because he knows constant change is here to stay. So I heard that when I'm driving in my 1974 Chevy Love yeah. <laughs> with the fourth cassette ever that I bought, listening to this song, and I bought into that. And when I became an educator on my third career, I didn't say, well, I'm in teaching now, so let's lock it all in. Okay? It is not okay to make change a novel thing. Change is what we do, right? Change is what we do. 
How many of you didn't use to shop for all of your clothes at Target and now you do? That was a change. How many people have tried something new on the in and out secret menu this year? So you've got to inspire in your staff this idea that this is what we do. We get better every day. I'm going to end up with this. I've been pretty close on time. 20 seconds. Okay. Oh, 20 seconds. Oh, great. My, my, my last superintendent I worked for said, John, I want a five-year plan for PD. And I said, good. Here it is. We're going to get better every day. We're going to go to the best events, and we're going to steal all the best stuff. There's your plan. She goes, I want a binder. I said, I don't work here. <laughs> you have to be rebuttal time? Okay, all right, good. First of all, let me tell you about my first cassette tape. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm not doing that. I'm not that. Uh, hey, I mean, just like a reiterate that if change is the only constant, right? If change is what we do, then we recognize in front of our teaching staff that they are change agents, that they change kids for a living, that they take high school freshmen and turn them into eventual adults. They are the change agents, and we are here as the administrative team to support them in the work they do. And so if we teach, and i got a slide on this later so I won't preach on it, but if we teach change as a topic mm -hmm. and embrace that they are the ones who are making the change, then they're empowered to be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, change is what we do. So I dig what you said is change is what we do. All right, boom. Why are we going to change? Because transparency is a powerful change management tool. Transparency is the game changer because it builds authentic trust, equity, and accountability. Imagine an organization where every decision was published somewhere and you could find it somewhere, where you had internal uh, intranet websites where every single grade level or every single subject matter had a clickable Google Doc for their collaborative agenda so the ninth grade ELA could click and see what 10th grade ELA is doing. 10th grade ELA can see what uh, math is doing. So they can actually cross collaborate. So they can see each other's productivity. They can see each other's work. Well, that type of transparency holds each other accountable. Like, man, these guys are killing it right now. And we're kind of slacking. So we're going to step up our game. The other thing it does is it creates um, uh, trust. Because like, OK. I trust your team's work as hard as my team because I've been a high school principal and I know what it looks like when the biology team's like, yeah, well, you know, algebra one, what are they doing, right? Like you are creating accountability and trust through transparency and it's one of the most powerful things you can do if every leadership team meeting is on a Google Doc, if your staff meeting is just a Google Doc that runs week after week after week and everybody can scroll back and say, oh my gosh, three months ago, they said they were going to do, they did do that. We can hold each other accountable because what we say we're going to do, we write it down, we put it in a place where you can always find it. It's totally transparent. And if I blow it and don't do it, you go ahead and call me out and say, hey, three months ago on the doc, you said you're going to do it, you didn't. And I get to say, yep, you're right, my bad. Thanks for holding me accountable. That's time. <laughs> One of the things we hear at school is we don't know what they're up to, right? <laughs> that there's this perception of, oh, they're doing something special, or it's away from me. So what John basically has, I'm interpreting for John again. <laughs> Imagine a single Google Doc that has a link to every staff planning meeting notes. Um, and, and basically, math can say, oh, you guys are using Flipgrid. Tell us about it. So it's this idea of the reality of it is, is all these changes are going to be public at some point. So why not make them public on the fly? So that's this, just a Google Doc with a tape, simple element. Okay, so now this is my favorite slide sequence right here, right? Yogi Bear. We don't get enough Yogi Bear quotes anymore. <laughs> Stay humble, trust your instincts. Most importantly, when you are come to the fork in the road, it's not about being perfect, it's about doing something, right? The worst thing you can do is do nothing. But there's more from Yogi. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. <laughs> right? So what the change is going to happen, and we already established that on my slide three. The change is going to happen. If you're not leading the change, you might end up someplace you don't want to be. And I call this on people who say they don't want to change. Look at the hybrids, look at the craft beer, look at the food trucks. People do like change. It's your job to help set a temperature, like John said, that change is what we do. We need to be ahead of what kids need, not behind it. And uh, so, like, would you not want change in medicine? No, uh, I don't want, uh, I do not want diabetes drugs that can reduce cardio death. Now, I'm good with our current diabetes training. Like, our, our, our treatment for diabetes now is fine. I don't want it better. Does that make sense in medicine? Or how about this? Uh, no, we don't want cellular Im immunotherapy for leukemia. We're good. Let's just do it the way we did it 40 years ago. Doesn't make sense in medicine. Doesn't make sense in education. And this is what we've got in education, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's next year, same worksheet.
This is what it looks like in education right now. We've got to be able to embrace a top 10 best new things we're doing in education. I yield the rest of my time. Woo, the title went off. Yes. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is this, that if our teachers are the change agents and they are the teachers as designers and the developers of the curriculum, then they get to bring their own passion to the curriculum. Teachers are part of the curriculum. The curriculum's not a book. The curriculum's not the Chromebook. Those are tools, and tools are leveraged by workmen who get work done. The teachers leverage the, the tools, and the teachers are part of the curriculum. So empower your teachers to bring themselves to the curriculum, that their passion should shine through. If they're just following a the script, then you might as well hire actors. They are developers of the curriculum because they're a part of it. Yeah, I love that jam. How's everybody doing? Smiling? Yeah, I love this crowd. You guys are awesome. <gasps> I stole this one from John Carimbo, so it's coming up next. I Bad apologize. Time. Yes, I stole this one from him. Uh, John <laughs> taught me this, and I've used it in my organization in powerful ways, and it is this. Asking the right questions is a powerful change management tool. You see, you walk into a steakhouse and you order up a big old fat steak and you eat it up. If the waiter comes over and goes, how's your steak? You're probably going to say, it's good, it's fine, right? You ask that question, how was the staff meeting today? It was fine. Hey, how was this semester for you guys as a collaborative team? It was fine. Ask the right questions. Hey, how can we make that steak better? It, it, it was a little salty. You're going to get good feedback if you ask the right question. How can we make that steak better? It was a little salty. Now, we're at them, right? We gotta have a little, little thick skin, we gotta toughen up and be okay with hearing the feedback, but once you start to get that feedback, that's step one. Step two is taking action on that feedback. That creates transparency and trust, and your staff will follow you off a cliff if you take really constructive feedback and then construct upon it. If you take good, solid feedback and use it, people will be like, that's my leader, I'm following them. So I think asking the right questions really helps manage change. I'll concede my time to John, who I stole this concept from. <laughs> How can we improve, right? One of the best things you can do with your staff, and we did a jet review for you guys a little over a year ago, and what we did is we asked all of your different stakeholder groups three questions. What are we good at? That's a good one, a lot of pride. The second one is where the party really starts. What annoys you about our technology? Get eight kids in a room and ask them what annoys you about your school technology. You're going to find out really quick. It's a little different flavor, but just get them together and go, you know what, what annoys you? Because as a leader, one of the best things you can do is a lot of little wins that build up to a big win. And the best way to get the little wins is say, what annoys you? Yeah. Oh, that leads right into my next slide. A lot of times, have you guys ever lived this in a school district where you get a new leader and they're like, we're going to go and do everything different? What's the staff reaction? Oh, hunker down. We're going to wait this one out. In a year and a half, that person will be moving on. <laughs> Am I pretty close? Yeah. We've all lived that. So my deal is, it's not about home runs. It is about getting some singles and some bunts. You know what? The Major League Pro Baseball players still hit bunts. Do you know why? Bunts equal runs. Right? You've got to be willing to bunt a lot and get some positive momentum. Which leads back to my last one off of John, which is ask them what's annoying and take it away. Yeah. When you show up in a staff meeting, they will say, that's the leader that takes away annoying things. Addition by subtraction. Take annoying things away. Then when you come in and go, you guys, I've got a crazy idea. They go, well, all of your other crazy ideas have worked. Let's go a little bit. <laughs> so you want to build that base. A lot of things that work that are sensible so that when you want to go downtown, when you want to call your shot, New grade book coming. They go, everything's worked so far. Let's give it a shot. Yeah, I love that one right there. I mean, the only thing that makes you think is like teamwork makes the dream work. And I know that's just kind of a little cliche, but the truth is, if you can find ways to leverage the RBI, if you can find ways to say, man, your team, by doing what you just did, scored our whole school a run. And I know it's hard on your team, but man, I got to celebrate that which I wish to perpetuate. This team, you guys really rallied, and yep, you had to lay down a bunt, but it brought in a run. Like, if you can find ways to celebrate teamwork, where the whole school won because of the uh, work of a, of a few, man, that's a, that's a big win. I buy that. Uh, well, I love this off with John Brady, man. I should, this is all my future keynotes. Should be like, and I'm going to do a seven inning stretch. We haven't seen each other's slides at this point. So we're just... <laughs> Yeah, we're really making this up on the fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, that was part of the game, right? It's not seeing each other's slides. All right, here's what's going next. 
Uh, well, why change? Because iteration is a powerful change management tool. My mentor once told me, when I first got to admin long ago before the gray hair, my mentor told me you need three things to make change. You need a desired state, a current reality, and a rubber band. If your desired state, you can imagine how amazing you want your school to be, it's way over there. Your current reality is really what's happening right now. A true checkup from the neck of where is my school, and all you have is a rubber band. You need to stretch the direction of that desired state as far as that rubber band will stretch, and when you feel the tension, change is happening. Is that true? When you feel the tension, you know change is happening. And so what you do is just make one change in the direction of the desired state. It's a small change. It's a little win. It's one little thing. And hold the tension. And eventually, your staff's going to be like, okay, is this what we're doing? Is this the thing? Is this the one thing you want us to do? Okay, won't you? Whoop. And as soon as that happens, admin, whoop, we find the next stretch, the next iteration, the next little. And you know what? Some staff members have big rubber bands. They're like, hey, we got this. No problem, principal. Some of our staff members have the rubber bands you had on them. On your braces? Remember, oh, oh my God, you just keep stretching, you got this. Just hang in there, and finally you're like, we're going, we're going, right? Was that time? Yeah. Iteration <laughs> is the powerful change manager tool. Okay, uh, my, my, my high five to John is my last slide, right? Yeah. You can't be swinging for the fence all the time. You're gonna strip people of gears. Go for some good things. Just walk into the next staff meeting and go, I need you guys to work in groups to come up with three crappy things we can stop doing next week. <laughs> and then do them next week. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna relate you back to Katina Hogan who says this, don't do a survey unless you're gonna take action. Yeah. Do not. So never survey the kids about the cafeteria food because we have no power. <laughs> don't do it, you're just pissing them off. <laughs> All right, number nine. For me, is uh, you guys should all make a note to read this blog post. It's a blog post called 17 Reasons High School is Better Than Football. It was written in 1998, you guys. And this guy, Herb Childress, visited classrooms in Northern California, even though he is a, a direct, uh, he has a really fancy title at an architectural school in Boston. They paid him for a year to do uh, social anthropology at a high school in Northern California. And this is what he found. Boredom. He found kids that would play football, do FFA, do cheerleading, swim at four in the morning. Those same kids would get an F in their English class because they were bored, okay? And he saw striking and consistent differences between perfunctory classroom sessions and lively extracurricular. So uh, this is 20 years ago, you guys. You see my theme on change? Who wants their 20-year-old car back, anybody? <laughs> Who wants their 20-year-old computer back? Anybody want your 20 year old phone back? You might, you want your 20 year old music back. You want your 20 year old body back. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this one up with this. In five years, between 1940 and 1945, this was a first class fighter in the United States Air Force in 1940, and this is a jet fighter five years later. We are getting our asses kicked in education in terms of staying up with the world. We're buying all of our worksheets at Target. <laughs> we'll stop with that. Man, I tell you, my first rebuttal of the session is the nine. I know that some people will say we're getting our butts kicked in uh, the field of education, but I'm here to tell you, like, I met with your teachers yesterday, and the difference between the teachers who were here yesterday and us getting our butts kicked is they were here yesterday. We had 20-year <laughs> educators, 20 years in your district, who showed up on a summer day. That's not getting our butts kicked. That's saying. Give us the tools, we want to play. So I mean, I would say, is it possible to get our butts kicked? Yes, but I'm saying you are in a place right now where you had people show up, and those are your lead learners. Those are your people you want to kick out and get them to the conference. Remember, remember the bell curve, the, those are your people. Right, I mean, we've got, you, you, you got the time. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not saying we're getting our butts kicked everywhere. Right. You guys are here, teachers are here. What I'm saying is, as an industry, <laughs> as an industry, we are not winning. Teaching change. I can't wait to rebut this one. Is it, but yeah. Too much graphic. <laughs> ah! um, teaching change is a powerful change management tool. If we've empowered our teachers to know that they are change agents, then we need to teach them about the act of change itself. You need all of the blue line to make change, right? You need trust of that the change is a good change. You need people to understand the vision. They need to have the skills to, in, in, to make the change. The resource, the most common resource is the resource of Time. Give people time. They need to understand the payoff and they need to have an action plan. With that, you get change. But let's say people don't understand the vision, 
It ends up in confusion. And if they don't have the skill, it ends up in anxiety. And if you ever roll the Chromebook cart in your classroom, and be like, I know you never used that before, but good luck, make education happen. Then you don't have the skills for it, it leads to anxiety and crocodile tears legit. And the staff are going, I can't believe they're doing this to us, right? Give people the skills, the resources, the payoff, and the action plan before you implement change and you will end up with change. Miss one of these boxes and you'll get sabotaged or confusion, you'll get anxiety, or is this real? If you don't give people the resource of time, it ends up in anger. And that's real. So give people all that they need to make change and put this slide in front of your staff and say, staff, I want to make sure we have common language. So that Mrs. Smith, three weeks into the change, can go, hey, you know what, Mr. Jones? I don't, I'm a little confused, but I think I don't understand the vision. Or I'm throwing some anxiety. I'm afraid I don't have the skills. Give this to your staff. Teach them about change, and they'll give it back to you in tenfold. Rebuttal? Uh, no rebuttal. Just a high five on this. I think this is just really speaks to being strategic, right? And, and what, again, what John said earlier, different people are going to want different ways to attack the problem. And so what you're doing is realizing when you're looking at your staff that there's a mosaic of needs and wants and desires out there. It's a mosaic. So you use different verbiage at different times to get the different things done. And it's, this is a really good thing. I would not put this up in the classrooms. That's a joke. Uh, I would not put this up in your office, but you need it maybe under your keyboard. <laughs> Oh yeah, your anxiety. Okay, hold on. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna talk to you like this right now. Right <laughs> on, game over. Game over. Game over. Game over. Game over.